Good morning. Welcome to Manitou United Methodist Virtual Service. We're glad you could join us. Won't you come in? community celebrates communion. So if you'd like to participate in communion, please take a moment to gather together some bread or crackers and a cup with juice or wine or water. Will you please join me in the call to worship? The religious didn't recognize John the Baptist as being sent by God because he was too serious, strict, and demanding. The religious didn't recognize Jesus as God in the flesh. Because he was too joyful, excessive, and inclusive of outsiders. Give us eyes to see, Lord. Help us to recognize the ways you are showing up in our world. Good play. 
morning. As many of you are already aware, the Greater Northwest Conference has provided its churches with a four-phase plan for reopening. The phases do not run in conjunction with our state's phases and require the church community to submit a plan that outlines how they reimagine their church reopening under each phase. SALT is currently working on its reimagining plan, especially as it pertains to in-person gatherings and worship. They will be sending out a letter with additional information regarding the restrictions for in-person gatherings and worship under each phase, along with a short survey to help guide their decisions moving forward. If you'd like to connect with church members after Sunday service, please consider joining us for our virtual fellowship coffee hour on Zoom. Just send me an email to pastordetain at gmail.com and I'll send you information on how you can join in on the fun. I wanna thank you for continuing to support our ministry partners through your donations. Every week, our group of volunteers are amazed by your generosity to Shalom Ministries and Family Promise. Each week, the church sends out an updated list of donation needs for each of our ministry partners. We have a dedicated team of individuals who will receive your donations each Wednesday from 1.30 p.m. to 2 p.m. in the church parking lot on 33rd Street, across from the church building. Just bring your items to the drop-off location and our team will transport them to our ministry partners. Please remember to keep your Manitou friends, family, and loved ones in your prayers this week. We have prayers for protection for Doug and Tiffany Adams and Patty Kirby. Prayers for healing and recovery and peace for Evelyn Torkelson's brother, Larry Barty, Sheila and Pam, Shelly Cuny, Jill Longmire, Eleanor Miller, Jody Weaver, Dave Grinnick, Phyllis Everest, Carol Swedberg, Jerry Porter, Gail Glass, and Janelle Branson. Will you please join me in prayer? God, we give you thanks for this virtual gathering, for the opportunity to worship you together, even as we sit separately at home. And we ask that you would come and meet us in our worship today, that we would sense your presence with us, and that you would remind each of us that you care for us and that we are not alone. God, our lives are not without joyful moments. And we want to take a moment to give you thanks for the many good and joyful things you have blessed us with. And we take a moment to silently lift our thanks to you for those gifts now. God, we carry many burdens with us. We are burdened by things happening in our community and world, burdened by things happening in our own lives and in the lives of those we love and care about. God, in this moment of silence, we lift up the burdens on our hearts to you in prayer. God, we lift up our community country, and the world. And we ask that you would be at work bringing your justice, hope, and peace where they are absent. Help us to partner with you in your kingdom work. Please join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. New Testament from Matthew chapter 11 verses 16 through 19 but to what will I compare this generation it is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another we played the flute for you and you did not dance we wailed and you did not mourn for John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been in a situation where the bar just keeps getting moved further and further ahead of you? Perhaps you were promised you'd make partner at your firm after a certain amount of years or clients, but that list of requirements kept getting longer with each passing year. Or maybe your parent had promised you certain freedoms by a certain age, but they changed their mind as the time was drawing near for that piercing or first date or solo road trip. When I was working on my doctoral research, I had to submit a research proposal to my university's Institutional Review Board, IRB for short. The IRB process had to be completed before you could begin any research project with live subjects. And my IRB process was a doozy. Part of my research was going to be conducted with adolescents who being minors are considered a protected population. And that meant that my approval process would be far more strenuous and involved than it would have been had I been working with adults. So I fully expected to make revisions to my first proposal and submit it a second time. That's pretty much par for the course in the IRB process. But what I hadn't expected was having to submit my IRB proposal a third time. My IRB process had already been time consuming. The committee met on a limited schedule, so revisions could take over a month to be processed and approved. So having to submit my IRB a third time with revisions meant that I was way behind my original research schedule. And as you can imagine, working full-time at a church while working on your doctorate can be more than a little stressful. Lots of late evenings and weekends studying. I had been pushing to finish my thesis in a timely manner so that I wouldn't have it hanging over my head anymore. Because by this point, I just wanted to be done. 
So the stress of having my second IRB proposal returned with requests for more revisions took the wind out of my sails. And quite frankly, it made me mad. Mad because the sections of my proposal the committee had requested revisions for had been present in my first proposal. So any requests for revisions to those sections should have been requested the first time around. That bar had been moved and I was mad. So after I shed more than a few tears over the matter, I vented my frustrations in the form of an email to my advisor and to the dean of the program. I wanted to understand why the bar had been moved and how they could request changes to the sections of my proposal that had not been flagged been flagged the first time I had submitted it. And what I found out is that the chair of the IRB committee had changed in between the submission of my first proposal and my second submission with the revisions they had requested. And the new IRB chair's bar was different from the old IRB's chair bar. So instead of allowing my request to be approved after it was submitted the second time with all of the requested revisions being met, the chair had moved the bar and my proposal would have to undergo a third round of revisions. I still get fired up thinking about that whole process and how it unfolded because it took up months of my life and it ruined my research schedule. John the Baptist and Jesus knew all about what it was like to have the bar moved. They were never able to meet the standards of the religious elite of Israel. And what made things all the more confusing was that John and Jesus's ministries couldn't have been more different from each other. And yet neither one was welcomed or accepted by the religious elite. John was a bug-eating wilderness prophet whose life was devoid of earthly pleasures, whereas Jesus was known to love a good meal with all kinds of company. John wore a scratchy shirt on purpose, forgoing the regular comforts of life. While Jesus had been persuaded to produce a miracle that kept the wine flowing at a wedding. John and Jesus' ministries were so different from one another, and yet both had one thing in common. They had both received the cold shoulder from the religious elite. In fact, Jesus compared the religious elite of his day to children who kept changing the music or the rules of a game. They just kept moving the bar on them. John the Baptist came neither eating or drinking, and that's why the religious elite didn't care for him. He was too old school for their taste, too stern, too demanding. They didn't appreciate his calls for self-examination, repentance, his calls to embrace God's will and ways with one's whole life. It was too extreme for them. They played their upbeat religious mixtape and called for John to lighten up and lay off the hellfire and brimstone and dance to their upbeat tunes instead. And then Jesus came along. And Jesus, he was ready to dance and dance like the religious elite had never dreamed. Every meal was a party as long as everyone was invited. So these hyper-religious individuals complained about the company Jesus was keeping, calling him a glutton and a drunkard, a man who made friends out of tax collectors and sinners. So the religious elite switched up the music again, putting on a mixtape that was low-key and on-danceable. Don't dance, Jesus. You need to be more serious 
and more careful about the dance partners that you're choosing. John the Baptist and Jesus were never going to reach the bar set by the religious elite because the bar was a moving target. And I'd like to believe that most of these religious individuals truly believed that they were helping to preserve the faith. I really want to believe that they thought they were doing the right thing. But I fear that unbeknownst to themselves, they were more motivated by their own comfort and power than anything else. And John and Jesus handled the situation so much better than I would have. They didn't cry or get mad like I did with my IRB. They didn't send a scroll or a tablet to the editor of Judaism today, alerting them to the religious leader's fickle ways. Nope. John and Jesus would call out the religious leaders when they tried to trip them up, and then they would just keep on doing their thing. Because here's what John and Jesus knew. They knew they didn't need the religious elite's approval. It was God who owned and set the bar, not the religious elite. The authority of the religious thought that they possessed was man-made and paled in comparison to the amazing work that the Spirit had been accomplishing through the ministries of John and Jesus. And you kind of have to see the humor in all of this because the religious elite were attempting to try and tell Jesus, God in the flesh, that he was getting it wrong. These religious individuals have forgotten who owned the bar and whose people they really were and whose spirit they were supposed to follow. They have forgotten that it was God who set the bar for what God was up to and who God could use. And I don't think that these religious individuals ever intended to be on the wrong side of things. But here they were, standing in the way of God's work in the world, in the way of God himself. And this is an interesting lesson for us to remember because it can be so easy for us to end up on the wrong side of things. Let's face it. We too are well-meaning religious people. And I fear that we are in some ways in as much danger as the religious elite of Jesus's time, of being more motivated by our own comfort and power than by the Spirit of God. And like the religious elite, we too can become a little overconfident, a little big for our britches, we too can think we know exactly what God is and is not doing, who God is and is not using. And this happens because we forget that God owns the bar. It's God's kingdom that we're a part of and it's God's mission that we are on. You and I do not get to decide who God can use or where God can and cannot be at work. We have already talked a lot about how living a better story with our lives can be hard at times and downright uncomfortable. And like the religious of Jesus's time, God's ways may feel a little too much for us at times, a little too stifling, strict or demanding, or maybe a little too joy-filled, excessive, inclusive, a little too forgiving? In fact, when you live a life in tune with the Spirit's work in the world, you will often find yourself think thinking, you want me to grow and change how? You want me to include who? You want me to go where? You are gonna use who? I need to forgive them. But church, if we are going to live a better story with our lives, 
if we are going to live our lives as people empowered by the Spirit of God, then we are going to have to get uncomfortable. Because if we don't, then one day we'll wake up and realize that we've been playing and dancing to the wrong mixtape all along. That we have stunted our growth as members of the kingdom of God and that we have excluded the very ones God loves and wants to redeem. So let's make sure that we don't wake up and find that we've been grooving to the tunes of comfort and power, but instead to the tunes of God's spirit at work in the world. So church, let's do our best to live lives that seek to hear and dance to the spirit of God's work in our world today. Amen. was betrayed, he took the bread, broke it, passed it out among his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he lifted up the cup, and he said, This cup represents my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Amen. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all those gathered around this virtual table and on all these gifts of bread and cup. May them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. So by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world. Amen.
Thank you for the ways that you continue to faithfully support our church community with your prayers, virtual and physically distant presence, gifts, service, and witness. God is still at work in and through our community, and I, and I am deeply grateful for the way that each of you makes that possible. Will you please join me in prayer? God, we give our gifts in gratitude for your blessing. We give our gifts with hope as we hunger and thirst for righteousness. May our offering of money, time, and talent be used to comfort those who mourn, to extend mercy, to make peace, to help us be your hands, feet, and voice in our community and world. Amen. peace this day. Amen. i